We're here in the beautiful season of fall and a lot of us will look out the window and think nothing more of the changing colors and falling leaves, nothing more than, that's pretty. But I feel like as Christians, we should think more about that. I feel like fall is God's reminder to us that in him, death is beautiful. Death is not something to be feared. And he made it that way when he took our sins and put them on that cross and buried them away so we could have life. I'd like to read from Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, if I can get my Bible to turn there. <laughs> no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for your son's sacrifice and for loving us so much to take away our sins so we can be with you forever in heaven. Help as we Help us as we partake in the bread. Help it to uh, help it to uh, hearten us to tell others about this wonderful story and uh, please bless it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's pray again. Dear God, thank you so much for your, your son's blood that was spilt to cover our sins. Uh, thank you for giving us eternal life in you and the opportunity to tell others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Dear God, thank you for giving us everything we need and more. Um, please bless this offering and give us happiness and will willingness to give and help it all to go to furthering your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So guys, today we're going to look at a passage of scripture, Psalm 3, and it talks about well, David writes it, and he talks about being worried, anxious, maybe even scared at times, but he can go ahead and lay down and sleep confidently because God's taken care of him. Do you guys ever feel a little bit scared or worried at night, maybe when you lay down for bed? Yeah? I do. Yeah, you do? I feel like there's a witch. You what? I feel like there's a witch. You feel like there's a witch? Oh, yeah. Okay, you need to watch Monsters, Inc. There's no such thing. Well, they are, but it's, it's all for good purposes. Yeah. So, okay. I've watched all of them. Have you? Good. Yeah? I don't know how to say that right now. Okay, I just started to pretend and just started to look like You're not scared of anything? Well, I beg to differ. I know your dad, and he's told me that at night sometimes you're scared. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you know what? Something that you can be confident about, Everly, you talked about having like uh, your lammy that you hold, it makes you feel a little bit safer. Do any of you have like a stuffed animal or anything you hold at night? I have, I have a stuffed animal. Yeah, what is it? I do. You do? It's a, I, it's a stuffed animal turtle. A stuffed animal turtle? I have a A turtle from Hawaii has come all the way here to make Corbin feel safe at night. That's awesome. And Davy, you said you have one too? What is it? Well, I have a lot and it's called sheep. And it's called sheep? Is it a sheep? Yes. Okay. And there's more and there's a whale. The, there's, a, there's a whale that there's a whale. I sleep at night too. Okay. A whale and a sheep. Okay. Anybody else? How about you? You have a beaver. Okay, I have cool. A unicorn and a, cat and, um, a, um, a tiger. And a unicorn, a cat, a tiger. Three unicorns. Four unicorns. Four unicorns? <laughs> Man, that's like. 
Plenty more unicorns, okay. Wow. If you're looking for a pot of gold, it might be at her bedroom. I don't know, lots of unicorns and stuff. Okay, that's cool. If you had one, you'd kick it off your bed, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's great. Well, guys, I want you to think about something. Just like maybe a stuffed animal or something special you have makes you feel safe at night, the same thing can happen when you think about the Lord being with you. Sometimes if you're feeling alone, you need to remember that God is with you. We just sang a song, God will take care of you through every day or all the way. In other words, in every situation, God can be with you to take care of you so you can feel safe to sleep at night, okay? So I want to do a song today, and I think we, I may have taught this before, um, but the words come from Psalm 3. So if you haven't turned there already, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Psalm 3. Um, but this is a song that comes right from that word in Psalm 3, okay? And we're going to teach it here together. And the song, the words are, I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me. What do you think that means? Ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me. What do you think? Um, God, can protect God can protect you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, she got it, okay. Yeah, so even though 10,000 people are against you, that's okay. You know that you don't have to be afraid because God is with you on your side, that's right, okay? So that's the first part of it. I am not afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me. And then the next part is, arise, arise, deliver me, oh my God, okay? And it's fun, if you really get to know it well, you can sing it as a round, but we'll just keep it all simple today, okay? So it goes like this. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me. Arise, arise, deliver me, oh my God. Arise, arise, deliver me, O oh my God. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me. Arise, arise, deliver me, O oh my God. Arise, arise, deliver me, O oh my God. Have you ever had a situation in life that happened where you call for help? Yes. Yeah? Like maybe you're out riding your bike and you fall off and you hurt yourself. Help, Dad! Okay. With training wheels or without? Without. Without. Whew, that means moving fast. Okay, yeah. So that's the same thing in that song when we say, Arise, arise, deliver me, oh my God. We're saying, Help, God. Come to my aid. Come help me. Okay? So remember that song. Whenever you feel scared, afraid of anything, ask God, Arise and help me. Okay? And He'll be there for you. Okay? So for a, a period of several weeks, I have been telling you that we were going to start on the book of Genesis at some point, but I was just waiting for LTC Northwest to put up their study questions so we can coordinate with that. It's happened. So Thursday night, the questions went up and I knew, okay, so now next Sunday, we're going to start on that. So this is going to be the, the theme for, <clears throat> excuse me, for, leader, <clears throat> for leadership training for Christ Northwest. And so we're participating in that as a congregation, and which means kids grades 3 through 12 can participate in that, and it, it works to encourage them to use their God-given abilities, characteristics, um, to bless other people, to serve in the church. Everything from developing a podcast, to doing a speech, to singing songs, to doing puppets, whatever, uh, whatever your kid 
is into and whatever God has gifted them with, they can use for the church. And so this is the theme this year, the book of Genesis, and it's called Promise. And you can see here in this picture just a portion of Michelangelo's painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which was completed around 1512. Isn't that amazing? Like 500 years ago, somebody walks around and they're just there. Uh, 500 years ago or so, Michelangelo painted that. And um, if you've seen the whole painting, you know why I've just focused in on the hands here. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, you can see here on the right, the picture is God is reaching out to touch the finger of Adam, the first man. And so it's, a, it's an artistic expression of the creation of mankind. But I think it also gets at uh, God wanting to be involved personally with His creation. He reaches out and touches. He doesn't just create things and then take off and sit on His cosmic rocking chair and just, you know, doesn't have anything to do with His creation anymore. He touches His creation. He enters into creation and walks around in it. So uh, we can see here that our God is one who makes promises and keeps them. And so we're going to be looking at the book of Genesis for quite a while now into next spring. So get familiar with it. Next week, we're going to look at Genesis 1 through 2. So if you have, okay, I'm going to say if you have time, scratch that. Take time this week to read Genesis 1 through 2, and that's what we'll be looking at uh, next Sunday, okay? But for today, we're going to look at Psalm 3, okay? <clears throat> Psalm 3. Because I was still waiting this last week, and I didn't know when Genesis sheets were going to be available, uh, I wasn't sure where I was going to go uh, this day as I was preparing for it. And I can remember like Thursday morning, maybe Wednesday morning, sitting down with our family, and we have a, a morning devotional time. And we're going through a book by uh, Marty Mikowski looking at Psalms. And in that book that morning, you know, it was going to be Psalm 3. And Elise was like, what's your day today? And I'm like, well, need to figure out what we're going to do Sunday. I'm not really sure. Um, maybe God will just come through and just speak to me where we're going today. I hope that's the case. We open up that book. I'm like, Psalm 3, that's where we're going. Perfect. You know, so uh, God really showed me where we were going to go today because I'm just mindful, so mindful. I'm looking out at you and I know a lot of your stories and a lot of the things that you're struggling with. And many of you have had some serious physical ailments that you've struggled with in your family, if not personally, at least in your family. Some of you are struggling with all kinds of emotional strain, maybe family strain, situations that are going on that have just made it very difficult to keep going with a smile on your face. And Psalm 3 is going to be a word to us today to encourage us, to give us confidence, to give us assurance that whatever it is, the Lord is with you and He can give you peace through it all. So Psalm 3 is where we're going here today. And if you look at Psalm 3, uh, in my Bible, there's a little superscription at the top. It says, a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Can you imagine, and maybe you can in ways, can you imagine that one of your own flesh and blood, one of the, your children that you nursed and fed and helped their boo-boos when they fell off their bike without training wheels, as we were reminded earlier, uh, went through all kinds of pain and struggle in life, relationships, kids calling them names, whatever. You were there to encourage them and help them. And pouring out money, feeding them, doing everything you can, and then that child turning on you as an adult and being like an enemy to you. That's what David experiences with his son Absalom. And uh, to begin with here, you can keep your, your uh, Bible marked at Psalm 3. I'm just going to give us just a little bit of a backstory. I'm thinking of 2 Samuel 15 here. Um, giving us just a, a bit of a taste of what it was like for David with his son Absalom turning against him. 2 Samuel 15, After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? 
And when he said, your servant is such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then, the Absalom, then Absalom would say, oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did all did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So here's dad is King David, right? And he is one of the most well-known kings of Israel, a powerful king, one that was known later as a man after God's own heart. Certainly not a perfect guy, but King David was a good king for Israel. And Absalom wants the throne. He wants power. And so Absalom stands out at the gate waiting for people to come in and they're coming to see the king. They're coming maybe with various um, disagreements or disputes or whatever and they would come for the king or a representative to help judge that case. And Absalom's standing there, hey, where are you from? And they would tell him, what's, your, what's the deal, you know? And the guy would say, oh, this has happened. You know, somebody moved the boundary markers at my, at my property. They're trying to steal some of my land. And say, oh, that's awful. Your case is true and right. Man, boy, if there was just justice in the land, you know. And, you know, the king has not, he doesn't have anybody set to take care of this, which was a lie. But, um, you know, if I were in charge, man, I would totally vote in your favor here. So if I was on the throne, things would be looking for good for you and your family. You know, why, why don't you come on up here? Let me give you a hug. <laughs> you know, and it says here, he stole the hearts of the people of Israel saying lies against his father, the king, because he wanted to be in charge instead. Get into 2 Samuel 18, verse 8. Just turn the, a page there, possibly, in your Bible. 2 Samuel 18. It goes on until, finally, father goes to war against son. David mustered the men who were with him and set over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and David sent out the army, one-third under the command of Joab, one-third under the command of Abishai, the son of Zeruai, Joab's brother, and one-third under the command of Ittai the Gittite. And the king said to the men, I myself will also go out with you. Could you imagine leading the army against your son and his army? But the men said, You shall not go out, for if we flee, they will not care about us, if half of us die, they will not care about us, but you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore, it's better that you send us help from the city. The king said to them, whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood at the side of the gate while all the army marched out by hundreds and by thousands. And the king ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, and he says these words, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. Even in that, you can hear He's sending them out to go to war against them. He says, but deal gently with my son. who He started all of this here, and this is all happening because of him. But deal gently with him. You can hear a father's heart and his cry and all of that. That's what's going on. Absalom, later in this chapter, goes on and, and he's killed. But you can imagine David writing the psalm that we're going to look at here, Psalm 3. With this kind of stuff in the background, that Absalom, his son, whom he raised up and loved and taught things, taught him how to tie his sandals, you know, all this kind of stuff, Absalom turns from him, says lies against him, tries to get the throne from his father, David. So here is the psalm. David says, O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him and God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. And here are the words of the song that we, we sang earlier. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. 
your blessing be on your people. So David, in this psalm, you can hear what was happening. You know, the, the grief he was struggling through against his son here. And he cries out to the Lord, O oh Lord, and whenever you see in the Bible, L-O-R-D, all in capital letters, that is, that is like the personal name of God, okay? Capital L-O-R-D is what we know of probably as pronounced like Yahweh. And God revealed that name to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses meets him at the burning bush and Moses asks, who are you? You know, when I go into Egypt to deliver your people out, who shall I say sent me? And God says, I am who I am. I am has sent you, okay? Or the Hebrew word Yahweh, okay? So basically here, um, David is crying out to the Lord with his personal name, I am. In other words, God is everything, right? He's the one that made everything, he sustains everything, and he will be forever. He is the great I am. That's who David cries out to. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? He feels like wherever he looks, there's things coming against him. And certainly real people here, his own son and his son's lackeys in the army that he's raising, and people are saying things against him. Man, if you would have appointed somebody, you know, at the gate to decide cases, this would be going a lot better. You didn't do that. And David's like, those, those are lies spread about me here. Those are the things that were coming against David here. Many are rising against me. Many are my foes. Many are saying of me, there's no salvation for you. This is going to be the end. There's no hope, David. That's what David was hearing. But David's response here is trust in the Lord. He says, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me. Have you ever seen little kids play like games against each other, imagination games like, you know, I, I'm going to get you with my laser. And one of them will say, I, I put up a shield and it blocked it. You know, you're like, yeah, but my, my gun goes through your shield. And so it doesn't, yeah, but my shield blocks everything. Okay. And, and there's no way either kid's going to win, right? Um, that's, David is saying here, you are a shield about me. No matter what is coming against me here, you are my shield. You're my protector. Nothing is going to get through to me here. You protect me. And he says, you are my glory, the lifter up of my head. Have things happened in the last year or so that have brought your head down, that you're feeling frustrated or worried and anxious, angry, sad, overwhelmed about? David says, you're the lifter up of my head. You're the one that gets me takes me by the chin and lifts my head back up again to have hope and to see around me that it's not as bad as I was thinking because God is a shield around me. He's protecting me here. And then exhaustion sets in. Maybe you've been so tired and overwhelmed with the things that have been coming from all sides that you just can't even keep awake. <laughs> you sit down finally for a moment on the couch and you find yourself falling asleep. That's that's what worry and stress can do to you and cause you to feel like that. And here David says in verse 5, I lay down and slept. And as I addressed the kids earlier, sometimes maybe you're having a hard time sleeping at night. As adults, I mean, in the middle of the night, 2.30, you wake up and you're like, why, why is this happening? And your mind starts going, the things you need to do, the things that are coming against you, you know, frustrations, puzzles, Problems you have to fix and you don't know how quite to adjust to it or how to handle it. David says, you know, hey, I understand that, but because God is my shield and the lifter up on my head, I can lay down and sleep. He's protecting me. He's going to take care of me here. I lay down and slept. And then he says, I awoke again for the Lord sustained me. He finally got some sleep, said, God is waking me back up here. He's given me rest. Now I can face the day again. Okay? You can have confidence in the Lord. And then he says very confidently, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me. Is that how many were coming against him? Well, yeah. I mean, you can read a little bit further on in 2 Samuel 18 there that about 20,000 died in that battle. 
Okay, so there were tens of thousands that were coming against him. He says, I'm not going to be afraid. No matter what is coming against me here, I trust the Lord, and He is my shield. He's the lifter up of my head. And he calls God to act. As I said to the kids, help, right? Arise, O Lord, save me. Save me, O my God. He feels intimately connected to God. You are my God. Arise and help me. And then he says something like a little kid might say, strike my enemies on the cheek. Break their teeth, okay? I mean, have you felt that way about enemies or things that have come against you and your frustration? He says, that's you, God. That's the power that you have, okay, to strike down my enemies, to change all of this. But you can see here a great assertion of his trust at the very end. Verse 8, salvation belongs to the Lord. David could trust in his chariots and his horses and his army. I mean, he was a, well, a well-known warrior in his own right. As a young guy, right, S- stepped out and took on the Philistines' warrior, their champion, uh, Goliath, um, and struck him down with a sling, right, and then cut off his head with Goliath's giant sword, right? So David, we don't know how old he was. He was a young man. But that's how his military career kind of got started. He was an incredible warrior here, but he says, I don't trust in any of that stuff. It's not about my ability with a slingshot or a sword or my armies or any of that kind of stuff. Salvation belongs to the Lord. You're the one that's got this. You've got my back. I'm going to trust you for it. And we can read this, and you look at the beginning there at verse 1 there. How many are my foes? Can you... Read yourself into that situation. Maybe you can feel like this psalm is for you. For David, it was Absalom and his lackeys that came against him, making him look bad, maligning him to everybody else, and then really coming to war against him here. He certainly had emotional heartache too, as a parent would for any child turning against them. And you can read this and you realize, well, maybe that's not my situation, but I've got foes. I've got things that have come against me. I feel like at times things are surrounding me and overwhelming me here. I don't know. This psalm is for you too. David's prayer is your prayer as well. So maybe think for a moment. Who are your foes? And you don't have to think personally. You don't have to start naming people, although that might be the situation. Don't name them out loud, please. But maybe that's what's going on with you is a personal situation, someone that's betrayed you or hurt you very deeply. Maybe that's your enemy. Maybe it's that your family has been fighting some pretty serious illnesses. We've been fighting COVID stuff. I know people that have been fighting serious cancer right now, Um, various kinds of illnesses like that. Maybe that's the foe that has been coming against you here. Maybe it's tension in your own family. A child or a parent or a cousin, a sibling. There's something that's come between you and that family member that's made it very difficult for you. Maybe that's the foe that you're facing. Maybe it's fear of all the things that are happening in the world. Every time you can turn on your computer or you turn on the TV or you open the newspaper, however it is you get some of the news that's going on around you, it can be overwhelming to see what's going on. And there's, it's just a, a, steady, a steady diet of terrible things are happening in the world and you better be terrified. Okay? And if you're terrified, then you need to listen to me. It's on and on and on, a steady stream of that stuff. So maybe you're fighting fear of things that are happening in our world and in our nation. Maybe you're just feeling really lonely. We have this uh, terrible deception that we are the most connected people in all of civilization because of smartphones and social media. You're constantly connected, you know. I make a little update on some things going on and, man, I've got 50 likes and some people have said that they care and they're praying for me. But then I don't even actually see these people face to face ever. Okay. Okay. It's good to see those things, but sometimes it can be a substitute for real human interaction, which can make you feel really lonely at the end of the day because that person is nothing more than a thumbs up 
or printing hands on a computer screen. That's not the same as actual human relationship. We can think that we're really connected, but maybe you feel really lonely. I know a lot of people who are holed up in their homes because of worries or concerns about COVID and so forth. They're feeling really lonely. Maybe that's the foe that you're facing. So David's prayer here about his foes can be your prayer too. What are the foes that you're facing? Maybe you feel like all around you, 10,000s of foes, whatever it is, are coming against you here and you feel it. But like David, you can say, but God, even though I'm facing all of this stuff here, you are a shield. You are my shield and nothing's going to get through it here. You are the lifter up of my head. I want you to see something. It's not that God is taking away the foes or the problems. We can kind of tell ourselves here, if God really loved me, He would remove this problem. He would stop this from happening. That's not the way things happen here. God doesn't promise, you know, if you believe in me and follow me, no problems. They'll all disappear. Life will be perfect for you. No, it doesn't work that way. That's not the way life is in this fallen world. But God does make a promise. Whatever problems come against you, I will be your shield. I will be with you. I'll walk through the problems with you, okay? So don't buy into that idea here that if God really loved you, he'd get rid of the problems. No, instead remember, God is my shield. He's with me through the problems. He protects me through those foes and those uh, situations. And then, I love this, after the battle has ceased, because at one point it will, it may be going on a lot longer than you want, the battle that you're facing is much longer than you had hoped for. But when it does end, he makes this promise too. You are the lifter up of my head, David says, and he will do the same for you. As you trust in him as your shield, he'll lift up your head too. He'll be your glory in all of that. He'll encourage you and lift you up once again. This psalm can be that for you. Now there's an interesting thing, and I don't know if your Bibles have it or not, but as we were reading through this, did you see... There was a little break in between some of the verses, and maybe off to the side on the right, it may have said, Selah. I don't know if you saw that or not. I didn't read that. And actually, if I would have read this properly, probably what I would have done is something like this. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. See, Selah is probably a musical term of some sort. Scholars much smarter than me haven't really conclusively figured this out, but it most likely means something like pause. So whether this is a song sung or a prayer uttered, when you read Selah, pause a moment and just let the words hang out there. You know, and it's just a reminder to me that whenever I'm feeling frustrated or worried or scared or I'm enduring some foe, some problem that I'm going through, slow down. Don't let the problems run away with you. Don't let him run over you. Slow down. Pause. Hit the pause button and just think for a moment. Before you write out a really scathing response on social media and hit send, say la. <laughs> pause. Think for a moment. And the same thing for your own routine, your rhythm of life. Pause. There's a reason why in creation, the God who never needs rest, rested on the seventh day. He created everything. He didn't need to rest because he was, boy, all that talking has really bushed me. I'm really tired. You know, that wasn't God. And I, that's certainly not God's voice. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but on the seventh day, he rested because he was setting an example for us. Stop. Say la. Rest a little bit. 
Hit the pause button on your busy, crazy life that's so important that if you don't keep going, everything's going to fall apart. Well, no, it won't. God is in charge. Okay? Hit pause. Rest. Once a week, rest. And it doesn't have to be you just laying on the couch doing nothing. It can be something that rejuvenates you in other ways. Um, for me this summer, it was going and getting firewood. That was a lot of work, but man, it was really rejuvenating for me. Okay? It can be the same thing for you. So this, this word selah in this psalm reminds us when you're facing worries and um, problems coming against you, slow down, hit pause, and that will help you trust in the Lord as well. And verse 7 reminds us, let the Lord do your fighting. Okay? When you make your battle plan, don't make it all about you. Make your first part of this battle here, God help me. You go before me. Salvation belongs to you, O Lord. You're the one that's going to save me here. Let me put my trust in you. And that will result in confidence, as verse 8 tells us. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He's the one that's going to do this here. So hopefully Psalm 3 can speak to you in whatever situation it is that you're facing today. So as we conclude this today, I'd like to ask a couple of things. First of all, do you have that kind of confidence do you know the Lord in that way that when something comes against you, you can say, Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God? Or do you sit there going, I'm overwhelmed, I don't know what to do. I'm crushed by everything that's coming against me. And you try to figure out how to handle it yourself. Do you have that kind of confidence? If you don't, today would be a great moment to go, You know what? I'm going to give my life to the Lord, I want to trust Him completely. I want to give him the mess that I am. Don't fool yourself in thinking that you can get your life straight first. You know, if I can get things figured out in my life, then God will accept me. No, it starts the other way around. I'm a mess. Salvation belongs to the Lord. God, help clean me up. Help fix me, okay? Repent of a life lived apart from him, whatever it is that you're struggling with. Give your life over to him. Say, I want Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be in charge. I'm going to trust in you for my all. You be my shield. You be the lifter up of my head. Put your faith in him. Put your old life to death in the waters of baptism. Be raised up to new life again through Jesus. Do you know him and have that kind of confidence? You can if you don't. That would be a good time to do that today. If he is your confidence, but you've forgotten that, Maybe you've said, yeah, Jesus is Lord of my life and I've made my commitment there, but you haven't been living that way. You keep carrying it yourself and Jesus is like, hey, I'm here, man. <laughs> Remember, I'm your shield. Hand it on to me. Let me share this with you. And you're like, no, I got this. You just stay there. Maybe you've gotten into that habit. Today would be a good time to go, you know what? I'm going to renew things here. I want you, God, to walk before me. I want you to be my shield. You be the lifter up of my head. Salvation belongs to the Lord, not you. Put your full trust in Him today.